the stage. Please give him a round of applause. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying CodeConf so far. Uh, today, as he mentioned, you're going to be learning about how we detect and mitigate fraud on Airbnb. So who am I? My name is Eric Levine. Uh, I'm the engineering manager for the trust and safety team at Airbnb. Um, I've been with the company for a little over three years. And prior to this, I was at Google for a couple of years. Uh, so for those of you don't, who don't know, uh, what is Airbnb? Uh, Airbnb is a platform that connects guests and hosts all around the world, where if you want to travel somewhere and stay in someone's home instead of in a hotel, for example, Airbnb will connect you. Or if you have a spare bedroom in your house, you can also uh, list your space on the platform, and we will help find you guests. So uh, what is trust and safety? Uh, well, at Airbnb, we believe that trust is the cornerstone of our platform. That if you don't trust our platform, you're not going to be willing to trust that you're going to be able to stay in someone's place and nothing's going to go wrong. Or if there are bad people who are constantly taking advantage of the, the system, then you're not going to trust it. So our job is to stop bad actors before they're able to affect us or our community. Uh, we're comprised of two organizations, a product organization and an operations organization. And we work together to create a safer, more trusted community. So today, we're going to learn about what fraud actually exists on Airbnb. We're going to talk about some machine learning basics, how we apply those basics to Airbnb, uh, some of the philosophies that we've developed over the years, and finally, what's next for the trust and safety team. So what does fraud on Airbnb actually look like? It turns out that it's a pretty standard smorgasbord of fraud that we see on our platform. Um, we see payment fraud, where someone uses something like a stolen credit card to make a transaction. We see fake listings where someone will put a room on the platform that doesn't actually exist in the real world. We see spam messages when someone is trying to solicit for some unaffiliated third party. Uh, we also see account hijackings when someone gets their credentials fished. Uh, they'll try to go onto their account and cause all sorts of havoc. So uh, now these are the types of fraud that we see on the platform. However, uh, we can't talk a lot about exactly how we stop those things, of course, because this is being live streamed. And so we don't want those bad actors who are trying to defraud us to know all of the, the secrets that we have. So instead, we're going to talk about a uh, slightly more contrived example of um, an issue that we had in the past where uh, people could time travel on Airbnb and how we can detect and mitigate people who are, are taking advantage of the system. So we had this bug on April 1st, 2015. April 1st, in case that wasn't clear. Um, we reverted it in 24 hours. Uh, but in the meantime, there was this particular pair that was creating all sorts of bookings on the site and traveling all throughout history, collecting all people through, through these things. And while they were nice enough guys, they didn't really have a lot of respect for the space. And they left things in a bit of a mess. So we're going to talk about how we could potentially stop this, this duo. So, Let's talk about the machine learning basics. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed, courtesy of Wikipedia. Uh, what does that mean in practice? That means we take things that have happened in the past and use them to predict things that happen in the future. So let's go through a basic example of that. When you're trying to build a machine learning system, first you need to come up with what are you actually trying to predict? And in this case, is it going to rain tomorrow? So features are what you're going to use to decide one way or another uh, what your prediction is going to be. In this case, is it cloudy? Uh, the prediction is what you think is going to happen. And then you have ground truth, which at the bottom you can see the features and the labels from past data. So these are the values for the features from the past and what actually happened. So um, those two things together make ground truth, and those are the critical aspect for building a machine learning system. So, uh, when you're building out the system, you also need to build out infrastructure. And you need to have a couple of things that you need to have figured out. One is, what's your delay tolerance? Is it OK if you detect something 72 hours after it happens? Or do you need to be able to detect things in real time? What models do you want to run? There are many different machine learning models, from support vector machines to naive Bayesian classifiers. Which one is going to work well for your scenario? And then when you detect something that is fraudulent, what do you actually do about that? Um, do you send it for manual review so that a human makes the decision of whether it's fraudulent or not? Do you introduce some friction, like CAPTCHA, to stop bots from you know, wreaking havoc on your system? Or do you require additional data so that you can be more confident in the decisions that you're making? So how does this all fit together? 
So again, you have the ground truth, the labels and the features, plug into a model training system that will produce a model and that will go into your model infrastructure that will then allow you to score things uh, uh, in the future. So how does this apply at Airbnb? So we built a system called the Fraud Prediction Service, which is comprised of three separate components. The signal service, the model service, and the model builder. And we'll go through each of these in turn. Uh, the signal service is how we collect the features that we use to make the predictions in real time. So that's one of the things that we've determined is important to us, is that we need to be able to make these decisions when they happen so that we can stop the bad actors before they're able to have any effect on our community. So we need this to be really fast. Uh, it needs to be configuration driven so that people who might not know how to actually write code can still contribute to the feature set that we're able to use to predict uh, fraudulent activity. Uh, we collect data uniformly, so it doesn't matter whether this data is coming from an external database or a, a separate service or even like a third party service. It all comes in the exact same way. And it resolves based on uh, graph resolution, and we'll go through an example of what I mean by that in just a moment. Uh, but let's get back to that example of how we're going to catch those time travelers. Uh, so we need to have discriminatory facts that will make up the features that we're going to use in our system. So in this case, the guests being located in San Dimas, uh, the use of the word dude in the profile description, and a reservation date in the past are the sort of contrived examples of things that we're going to use to predict this particular attack vector. So the API looks something like this, where you provide inputs. In this case, it's the reservation ID. You want to know if this particular reservation is with these two actors. And then the signals that you want to get out, the features that you want to get out. So again, it's whether the guest is located in San Dimas, whether the profile contains the word dude, and whether the reservation date is in the past. So let's get back to that graph resolution thing I was talking about. So as you can see here, we have a graph. The things on the very left, or the, the one thing on the very left is the input that we specified in the previous slide, the reservation ID. An arrow represents a dependency. So in order to determine, say, the reservation date, you need to know what the reservation ID is. So you can imagine that you need to resolve things starting on the left, going towards the right. Uh, I'm marking the required uh, features that we specified in the API call in the last slide uh, in orange here. And you can see that there are some features on here that are neither required nor a dependency of something that's required. In particular, the host ID and the host age, neither of those are actually required to figure out the, the features that we're trying to get. So we can actually just scratch them out of the graph altogether. They're gone. Uh, for the purposes of this particular call, they might as well not exist. Uh, so next, we're going to mark things as synchronous versus asynchronous. So synchronous in this case is just a, a little bit of code that's going to run. You know, do some comparison, do a subtraction, some, something very quick. We're talking about a couple microseconds here. Whereas the asynchronous ones are database fetches, service calls, things that are going to actually require a network round trip. So we're looking at several milliseconds. So this is multiple uh, orders of magnitude difference between one versus the other, which is important for how we actually are going to resolve this graph. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to um, greedily process the ones that are synchronous so that we can batch up as many of the asynchronous ones as possible together so that we have as few asynchronous batches as possible. So what does this look like? Uh, first, we start with the reservation ID. This is, again, the input that was provided to us. And in this case, uh, it was given to us, so there's no work involved in actually resolving this. Uh, there's no synchronous signals for us to process, so we're going to do a batch of asynchronous signals all at the same time. Then we're going to process the synchronous signal that we have there at the top, the past reservation, and then another batch of asynchronous signals, and finally a batch of synchronous signals. And so now we've managed to process all of the signals that we need for, uh, for the features that we've requested, and we're able to, to make the prediction against that. So that's the signal service. Next, we'll talk about the model service. Uh, so the model service is a PMML, it deploys PMML-based random forests. And PMML stands for the Predictive Modeling Markup Language. And what that means is uh, it's an XML format that specifies predictive models. Uh, there are many different systems that will produce PMML and many different systems that will consume it. So it's trying to be like a lingua franca for these predictive models so that they're very portable. Uh, it uses an HTTP interface. So any of the systems in our infrastructure will be able to figure out whether some, something is fraudulent. We score multiple models for a given event, 
So uh, we want to minimize the number of, again, network round trips that we have to do. And so if we have some particular activity that we want to predict multiple types of fraud against, we don't want to make multiple calls. We want to make one call and have them all score. And we'll go through what exactly we mean by that. It actually looks like this. So at the top, we have the service. The second layer are the um, actions on the site that we might want to predict against. And the third layer are the models that we have behind those. So again, we call the model service, which um, we want to figure out whether a reservation is a time traveler or not. So we go to the reservation requested action. And then the time traveler and chargeback models are behind that. Chargebacks referring to when someone uses a stolen credit card on our platform. So now we'll be able to score both of those without having to call the service multiple times. So next, we'll talk about how we actually train models. So when we gather all of these features from the signal service, we log all of the things that we saw in production to HDFS, the Hadoop file system. Uh, we also import the labels from manual review into HDFS so that we, all ha we have all of it in one place. And we'll go through that really quick. So a request comes into the fraud prediction service on the left. Uh, the first thing it needs to do is to collect the features it needs in order to make the prediction. So it'll call the signal service. Um, the signal service will gather the features from the databases or services. And when it returns to the fraud prediction service, it'll also log them to HDFS, like I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, then the features are sent to the model service to produce a score. Um, once we have a score, if it's high enough, we might send it for manual review so that someone will take a look at it so we can build our ground truth. The answers for those manual reviews go into the production database's labels. And those labels are then exported into HDFS. Now we have all of the ground truth we need in order to build a model living in one place. And so we can export those together to the training system that will produce a model that we can then upload onto the model service. Um, so that's how uh, the training system works. And uh, you can see that there's a lot of arrows pointing at a lot of other arrows, but it, I promise it all works. So I mentioned that we use uh, random forests. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that actually is. So a random forest is made up of a number of different uh, decision trees. So a decision tree might look like something like this, where each node in this tree represents a feature and each edge represents a value that that feature might uh, represent. So in this case, we can follow the arrows down, uh, just you know, making choices as we go. So does, do they use the word dude in their profile? Yes, they do. Uh, is the reservation in the past? Yes, it is. So we can conclude that this is indeed uh, the, the, the actors that we're looking for. So the random forest, as I said, is made up of a number of random trees. Uh, or these decision trees. And so the score that you produce is the percent of the trees that vote it as bad. So in this case, 75% of the trees vote bad, and so your score for how fraudulent you think something is, is 75%. So now we've determined that some activity is indeed these time travelers we're looking for, so we can introduce some sort of friction uh, or a thing to gather more information about uh, whether these are indeed the people we're looking for. They'll answer in a predictable way. Um, and so we've managed to catch them. Uh, and now we can send them to military camp in Alaska or whatever else we want to do. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the machine learning philosophies we've developed over the years. Uh, so we view the machine learning system as a collaboration between many different teams. The operations team, the data science team, and the engineering team. And it looks something like this, where the operations team, they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones who are actually looking at the fraudulent patterns that are happening day in and day out, helping people when, they, when you know, things fall through the cracks. So it starts with understanding. And they are really the ones who are best suited to really understand the fraudulent activity that's happening on our platform. They'll hand these insights off to our data science team to design features that we can use to discriminate between fraudulent and non-fraudulent activities. Uh, they'll also train models that we can then use to, to score uh, activities that are happening. The engineering team is responsible for actually using those models and scoring them in production. We're also responsible for mitigating things when we detect that something is or is not fraudulent. 
In certain cases, we will ask the operations team to review the decisions we've made. And then as they're going through and reviewing all of these patterns, they will gain a better understanding of the fraud that's happening on the site. So it's a virtuous cycle, um, and hopefully we get better and better at, at it as time goes on. So a couple other things. Uh, you require tr trustworthy ground truth. If your trust, excuse me, if your ground truth is not reliable, your models will never be effective. It's just, it, it won't happen. Um, you want to engineer discriminating features. If your features are basically random and not um, correlated with fraudulent activity, then they're not gonna be effective at, at discriminating. Uh, we've found that deferring model optimization is really in our best interest, that engineering a better feature is going to give us a lot more gains than trying to switch between one model and tweaking it to be a different model or, or anything like that. Uh, and then lastly, you wanna make sure that your cross-functional teams are perfectly aligned, that if your operations team disagrees with your data science team on what constitutes fraud and what doesn't, then instead of this being a virtuous cycle, you're probably gonna go into a death spiral where they're, they're just fighting with each other all the time. So. Uh, what's next for the trust and safety team? We're going to continue to scale our infrastructure. Um, as, the Air, as Airbnb continues to grow, we need to make sure that we're keeping up with, with the scale. We want to focus on clustering. So rather than looking at events in isolation, to look at events in aggregate and looking for these sorts of patterns. Uh, anomaly detection for allowing the system itself to find when something looks a little bit fishy. Uh, Automation, so there's a lot of human involvement in every step along the way of the process that I just described. But a lot of it could be automated, like the model building um, is currently done by a human. There's no, no need for that. Uh, and then gathering more data sources. Uh, as I said, feature engineering is the primary way that we're gonna gain, uh, make gains in fighting this fraudulent activity. So how can we get more and more data to be more and more confident in the decisions we're making? So uh, that's it. Uh, my name's Eric Levine again. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to find me around here or shoot me an email. Thank you very much.